The topic of this lesson is runoff modeling, which is the computation of the flow and accumulation of water on a terrain. Runoff modeling in GIS typically uses a simplified hydrological model, which consists of only precipitation, that is the rain that falls on the terrain, and overland flow, that is the water that flows on the surface of a terrain. That being said, the reality is more complex. Below the terrain there is the water table, which is the level at which the terrain is saturated with water. There is also infiltration, which is the flow of water from the surface of the terrain towards the water table. There is the return flow, which is when water comes out of the ground at levels below the water table. Wherever there is vegetation, there is the interception of water that falls on it and doesn't get to the level of the terrain. There is the transpiration of water from plants to the air, and the evaporation of water from a terrain surface to the air. Unfortunately, Modeling many of these flows is difficult, and it requires high-resolution data that is not easily available. So, for the purposes of this course, we will be looking at the simpler GIS models of runoff. These assume that all water flows are overland, and that rain is falling constantly and evenly all over a terrain. So, in practical terms, this means that if we have a DTM with elevation values, we want to compute two things for every cell. The flow direction, which is towards which other cells water flows, and the accumulated flow, which is the amount of water that accumulates on this cell because of the flow of water from other cells. Let's first have a look at a few different ways to compute the flow direction. The simplest method, which is available in essentially any GIS, is called the single flow direction method. When it's done in a raster DTM, it is also called the D8 method for the eight flow directions that you can use up, down, left, right, and the diagonals. The idea of the method is to assign all the flow of a cell towards its neighbor with the steepest downward slope. So, let's look at how this works in practice using the previous example. Slope is calculated as a difference in elevation divided by the distance between the cells. For the middle cell with an elevation of 7, we can disregard its three neighbors with elevations of 8 and 9 because we're only looking for downward slope. It's the same case for its two neighbors with an elevation of 7, because these have a slope of 0. Now, for its two neighbors with an elevation of 6, if we assume that the distance between the centers of the cells is 1, then the downward slope is given by 7 minus 6 divided by 1, and so the result is 1. Finally, for its neighbor with an elevation of 5, we need to consider that the distance between the cells is the square root of 2, and so the slope is given by 7 minus 5 divided by the square root of 2, which is also equal to the square root of 2, or about 1.41. Since the downward slope is steepest in the direction of this last neighbor, the flow direction is assigned towards it. Summarizing some of the pros and cons of the single flow direction method, it's very simple to do all the required calculations, and so it's also very fast. It's easy to implement, which in practice means that it's available everywhere. It doesn't disperse the flow of water, which is good because water flows tend to converge in reality, but it also doesn't support divergent flows, which do exist. For instance, think of river deltas. And the method comes with errors of up to 22.5 degrees, which are caused by having to choose a neighbor in increments of 45 degrees. An alternative to the single flow direction method is to split the flow of a cell to several of its neighbors according to some criteria, and there are a lot of methods to do this. They are collectively known as multiple flow direction methods. Most of the equations for these methods look something like this. Here, Fi is the flow towards a neighbor. Li is the flow width, which is the square root of 2 divided by 4 for the diagonal neighbors and 1 half for the others. And this value comes from the geometry of the DTM cells. If the width of a cell is 1, then the width of the flow to the up, down, left and right cells is one half, and the width of the flow to the diagonals is given by a right triangle where the sides are one fourth long. This is about 0 0.354. Going back to the equation, alpha i is the gradient, and so the tangent of alpha i is the slope. x is an exponent that controls the dispersion, and n is the number of neighbors of the cell. Note how the bottom part of the equation is just a way to normalize all the flows. So, going back to the previous example, the flows to the cell's neighbors with elevations of 7, 8 and 9 are all zero, 
Then, to compute the flow to the neighbors with an elevation of 6, we only have to look at the top part of the equation and then we can normalize all the values at the end. In the equation, a lie is one half for the adjacent cells as we previously mentioned. And the tangent of alpha i is the slope and thus 1. So the flow towards the two cells is one half before normalization. Now, for the neighbor with an elevation of 5, we know that li is the square root of 2 divided by 4, and the tangent of alpha i is the square root of 2. So the result is also one half before normalization. Since all of the flows are equal, the dispersion exponent actually doesn't matter, and after normalization all of the flows are one third of the total flow. Now, let's look at how to compute the second major value of runoff modeling in a DTM, which is flow accumulation. For this, we will use the calculated flow directions for all of the cells in the DTM. As we discussed previously, the simple GIS models of runoff assume a sort of constant precipitation falling all over a terrain, which means that the precipitation in a DTM cell is proportional to the area of the cell. And the accumulated flow at a DTM cell is equal to the area of the cells that drain to it. When all the cells' areas are the same, like in a raster grid, this is simpler because we only need to count cells. When the areas are different, like in a tin, we need to instead make a sum of the areas of the cells that drain to it. So, going back to the previous example, we know that there's one unit of water in all the cells that don't receive water from other cells. And for every other cell, we add up the accumulated flows of the cells that drain to it, plus one for the cell itself. Now, let's look at sinks, which cause problems when trying to do runoff modeling with a DTM. Sinks are areas in a DTM that are completely surrounded by higher terrain. Some of these are natural features that are present in the terrain, such as lakes, and where water would flow towards in reality and stay there. But they can also be artifacts of the DTM, or they can be very small and easily flooded, in which case we need to implement a mechanism to route water flows out of these sinks. For instance, imagine that there's a very strong gradient in a DTM with a big water flow. But because of a sink, our flow direction model says that all this water goes to the sink and never gets out. In the handout, we point to two papers that show different ways to solve this problem. The first relies on filling sinks up to the level of the surrounding terrain, and the second implements a variation of the A-star algorithm for routing, which allows water to flow out of these sinks. Apart from sinks, the other major DTM problem in runoff modeling are flats, which are areas with no local elevation gradient. Because of this, they do not have a well-defined flow direction, which is a problem for the water routing algorithms that we have just discussed. Flats can be natural features, but often they're the result of applying sink filling algorithms. These can convert a large valley to a large flat. The typical way to solve this problem is to consider that there's a gradient away from higher terrain or a gradient towards lower terrain. In the handout, we point to one paper that explains a method that combines both of these approaches. Finally, let's look at two concepts that can be derived from the flow direction and the flow accumulation in a DTM, drainage networks and basins. Starting with a DTM, in this case one of the Alps, we first compute the flow direction. The colors here correspond to one of the eight directions. Then, we compute the flow accumulation. In this example, we can already see that these two computed values form a network, which can be best interpreted as a vector and is called the drainage network. The drainage network extends to every cell of the DTM, but we typically use a flow accumulation threshold to select only the most important parts of the network. In this example, all the cells that drain less than 10 other cells are white, and progressively darker shades of blue correspond to 10, 100 and 1000 drained cells. Finally, we can extract the drainage basins of a DTM by considering the area that are drained by one or more nodes of the network. In this case, the nodes are put in places where rivers drain to the sea, and thus the basins reflect the areas that are drained by different rivers. This is a process that can be extended by selecting multiple nodes at once, or by merging multiple basins according to some criteria. For instance, we can select all the nodes of rivers that drain to specific oceans. 